also, uh, <clears throat> in other news, I posted a video. Sorry, Marty laughing, dribbling on my shirt. So if you're, if you're a pastor these days, it's interesting. Um, I get about five, between five and 15 um, video messages sent to me a week, per week, <laughs> of the latest prophecy. This is what so-and-so is saying about what's happening. This is what so-and-so is saying about what's happening. And I began to notice that apparently in the modern, modern breakdown of the Western church, your prophetic power is directly coupled to how many Instagram followers you have, just so you know. And so the bigger a guy's audience, the more authority he or she believe they have to tell us all what to do. And so there's these videos <laughs> where they're just going off telling all of us what to do. And I keep getting sent them. Hey, check out what this guy said you ought to be doing. Check out what this guy said you ought to be doing. And I, I, for the first 20 or 30, I watched. And then I got to where I was just like, I'm fine. How many of you are glad that the Holy Spirit's in you? Anybody glad about that? That the Holy Spirit's able to speak to you and that we don't actually need Pastor Big Shot from anywhere to tell us what to do because we are very capable of praying and seeking the face of God for ourselves. Whether you are brand new to faith or you've been in the church 30 years, the reality of the gospel is that Jesus is your king and his spirit is in your heart and he can show you what to do. So don't be the crowd clamoring for a word from somebody online. Go to your prayer closet and get your own. Amen? The Holy Spirit is ready, man. He's doing cool stuff, and he will speak to you every bit as quick as he's speaking to Pastor Big Jeans from wherever. You know what I mean? And so it's really arrogant to think, well, I pastor this one church, but I know what the whole country's supposed to do. Brother, no, go have another cup of coffee and leave the rest of us alone. Amen? And so as much as it may be disappointing to some of you, it may not be, I don't know, but I'm going to continue to do what God told me to do. Amen. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad because I don't know any other way to do it. So rather than trying to chase the latest idea of prophetic vision from anybody, we're just going to continue to teach sound doctrine, if that's all right with everybody. And we're going to continue. We started just starting to look at some end time events and some things from the scriptures about the last days. We're going to continue to do that, even though it puts me in direct defiance. Amen. Of what 10 different important pastors told me to preach about today, I'm going to go ahead and preach what the Holy Spirit gave me to do, and we'll stick with that. So if you get ready where you can stand for the reading of the Word of God, we're going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, three verses, verses, I believe it's 15 through 18 if I wrote it down, and uh, well, it helps if the pastor turns to the right book in his Bible. Just so you know, in case you didn't know, 1 Timothy says something else on that. But 1 Thessalonians, I'm rusty. It's been a couple weeks. Amen. I won't be as smooth as Wallace, but I'll do my best. So verse 15 tells us about a great event that most people have heard a lot about, and we're going to try to do, um, so we're going to just examine this a little bit. Verse 15. We tell you this directly from the Lord. I want you to notice that because that phrase is actually way more important than a lot of people give it weight. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and then we will be with the Lord forever. 
So encourage each other with these words. Amen? Amen. We're going to talk about the trumpet of God. Father, bless your word to our learning and admonition. Holy Spirit, lead us into the truth we need to continue to grow and be steadfast and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. So a couple weeks back before all of the traveling, we started into this, and I told you that I was just going to call the theme of this series Coming Attractions. Because of, and I gave you the analogy where you go to the movies and they have the trailers on, you know, they have the previews, and the preview comes on the screen and it gives you an idea about the movie. It's not supposed to tell you the whole movie. Um, have you ever seen where they do the preview badly and it gives you the whole movie? <laughs> Ever, ever noticed that? We were watching something the other day, and the preview came on, and three minutes later, when the preview was over, Stephen was like, well, we don't need to go see it now. <laughs> they gave us the whole thing. And so the whole idea of the preview is, here's the basic. Here's what the movie's about. Here's who's involved. And here's a basic idea of what the spirit of it is. And then keep watching, because this is coming out later. And a lot of times, and I don't mean to be over, overly simplistic, but a lot of times the prophetic scriptures in the Bible, a lot of times people get a little too, um, they get a little bit too stern about every detail. They start fighting about every nuance and dividing over every little thing. When in reality, a lot of times the scriptures that tell us about the future events are very much like the preview of a movie. You are getting the basic. You are getting the idea. You are getting told, hey, this is coming. Here's what to watch for. Here's some things to look at. And it's not giving you every single detail. It's not the entire movie. How many of you realize if God gave every single detail to every future event, you wouldn't even be able to carry your Bible, amen? You'd have to have one of them little ATV trailers behind your car just with your Bible on it. Was not enough room for it. So he gives us what we need. And when you study end things, that's what you have to remember. God gave us what we needed. Not necessarily every little detail we might want. Now, I told you when we began this, or so our first week of this, we talked about all the prophesied um, deception that was going to come into the church. If you weren't here, um, that message will be going up on our podcast this week. When this one is, if you want to remind yourself, podcasts are great because that's free. But the, the synopsis of it, the basic of the whole thing was that it is repeated throughout the scripture that the faithful in the church world will begin to be confronted by a false spirit that brings false teaching that is not in line with the sound doctrine of the Bible. And this will be readily accepted. And not only accepted, but it will become popular in the last days. We read scriptures from Peter and Paul where he began to explain that driven by greed and covetousness, you would see hugely successful, very charismatic leaders who are no longer teaching the actual word of God. They are teaching a man-made doctrine, a man-made God gospel that is a twisting of the truth, and it's not actually a surprise. We should actually stop being surprised by it because we were told that this was going to happen. And every pastor does well, actually, to remember Paul's final admonition from 1 Timothy chapter 3, or chapter 5, rather, where he said, look, understand that by the time you get to the last days, there will be people who will actually refuse to accept sound teaching. Now think about that for just a moment, because what are preachers mostly taught to do at Bible schools? Usually, the idea is the preacher learns how to teach sound doctrine. Well, Paul has gone ahead and told us, understand, no matter how good you preach, at the end of the age, the war will be about the content of your preaching, not the delivery of it. And there will come a time where if you dare to stand in your pulpit and teach sound doctrine, biblically sound, line by line, truth of the scriptures, people who call themselves Christians will reject that outright and flee from such a ministry in the name of serving Jesus. Now understand that that should have been alarming to us. We should have been watching for it. And instead, most of the preachers have mostly been asleep. 
and have bought into the lie that as long as more and more people are coming, we're doing it right. Even though Paul had already told us there's a point in this where a big crowd doesn't necessarily mean you did it right. It could mean that you compromised all the stuff that might convict anyone. It could mean that you are strategically avoiding every subject that might bother somebody. And instead, you are allowing people to remain in their error. And you are refusing to confront. I can tell you that in recent years, um, that has probably been the most difficult part about pastoring recently. 20 years ago, if somebody came to see the pastor for counseling, they just needed to know what the Bible said about something. They come in and they would sit down and they would say, hey, brother, this is happening, this is happening, this is what's going on with the kids, or this is what's going on between me and my wife, and we just need to know, man, what does the Bible say about that? What should we do? And you would sit and you would share scriptures, and you know that we are now arrived at a time, and details aren't important, and I won't sideline my message. I have a good sermon. I'm going to get right to it, but I'm telling you, you can clean a church out faster now just by giving scripture. You sit down in a counseling session now and you dare to say, well, the Bible says this. And they will go flat out the door because there's no regard left for the truth. The spirit of the age is, you tell me what I agree with or I'm out of here. And out of that, then, then there's been the ripping away at the authority of the word of God. So now, if you give a scripture to somebody, well, that's what you said. Are you kidding me? No, that's what the Bible says. I don't care what I said. And so out of that, there's a rejection. And what did Paul say? They will run around till they find a teacher who will tell them what they want to hear. And these are the hours that we're living in. So as soon as you get ready to get mad at me about anything, all I beg you to do is make sure it's actually a personal problem and not a word problem. If what you get upset with me about is something that I taught you from the scripture, please do not take that bait and run from truth. I'm a normal human being, so is it possible for me to hurt your feelings because I'm a dummy? Yes. Is it possible for me to say the wrong thing and offend you? Yes. Is it possible for me to forget your birthday? Absolutely. Is it possible for you to come and tell me something and I don't react perfectly? Absolutely. And if you get upset with me with any of that kind of stuff that I actually did, please, I understand. But use some discernment. If you start finding that you're getting upset, you better check out what you're upset about. And if what you're upset about is the truth is bothering you, Man, that is a snare from hell. You don't run from that. You run to Jesus and you say, Lord, you're the spirit of the truth. The truth shouldn't be bothering me. So help me, Jesus, because I should want to hear your word. I should want to know what the truth is. I should have an appetite to know what you said and a desire to walk in that way. And I'm beginning to contend with the truth. And that shouldn't be for a believer. How you doing? That was my introduction. It was free. So the next coming attraction, though, that we're going to talk about is this famous event that all the, all the Bible schools would call the rapture, the rapture of the church. Everybody say rapture. You'll notice that I called my teaching on it the trumpet of God rather than the rapture. Why? Well, because the word rapture isn't in the Bible. The word rapture is derived from the Latin version of the scriptures, and where Paul said in verse 17, those of us that will remain will be caught up, the Latin phrase brings us the word rapture. And, and it's, I'm not hair splitting hairs, but an interesting thing happens when men insert a word and then create a doctrine about that word. And then pretty soon, people are sure that word's got to be in the Bible somewhere because everybody that teaches on the last days uses the word rapture all the time. I have... A different slant not that it's not a real thing clearly it's a plainly taught Bible doctrine but I prefer to look at what's coming rather than the fact that we're leaving does that make sense to everybody rapture just speaks to we're out of here and when the world gets crazy that becomes popular <laughs> oh man 
one of these days, the trumpet's going to sound, and whoo, we are out of here. And it's supposed to be good news. He said, encourage each other with this fact. Hang on a little longer, brother, because one of these days, whew, we're out of here. And it's great. I, it's great. It's a biblical truth. I think sometimes it may be affected how we were while we were here. Because rather than investing all of our lives in what God gave us to do on the earth, so much of the church just started looking for the door. We're going to leave this behind. It doesn't matter if I know my neighbors very well because I'm probably going to leave them behind. It doesn't matter if I'm heavily invested in my community because I'm probably going to just leave all this behind because all through the 80s and the 90s and into the 2000s, man, all of this last day's stuff and the Left Behind series, amen, remember that? One of the worst movies ever made in the history of the world was Left Behind with Nicolas Cage. Now, if you are a Nick Cage fan, bless your heart. That proves that you have charity in your heart the man cannot act and one of the worst movies he ever made was when they did a movie of the left behind book and nick cage is the as the main star if you need something to laugh at today you go home on youtube you search for left behind the movie and when you see because any movie that's on youtube in its entirety how many of you know that's a hint that's a hint. And the whole thing is on there. And if you watch the first five minutes of Nick Cage's performance, you'll go like, whoa, where did they find this guy? It's horribly done. But it was made in a time when everybody was talking about the rapture. Everybody's selling books. Everybody talking about it. But we're not supposed to be escapists. Man, I'm just hanging on until we get to leave. No, so I prefer talking about who's coming. The trumpet of God will sound, why? Announcing who is coming. I'm excited about the fact that we go to meet the Lord in the air, but I'm most excited about the part where it's the Lord in the air. The trumpet will sound to announce that the same Jesus who conquered death and hell and ascended to the right hand of the majesty on high is returning for his purchased possession, the church. And the trumpet will sound to announce his arrival. And it's a powerful, amazing truth. Now, there's a couple of important things in that scripture. We'll just grab them real quickly. Paul says in uh, verse 15, and I told you to take note of this. Verse 15, he said, we tell you this directly from the Lord. Okay? The Greek translation literally is by the actual teaching of Jesus himself. So in other words... The event Paul is referencing, he is telling us this is the same event Jesus told his boys about. So in a minute, we're going to go to Matthew 24 and look at where Jesus said it. And that's important because some people have played a little bit of shenanigans with that, trying to play around. We are going to do some theological discipline, remember? We're going to let the Bible say what the Bible says. And where there's blanks, we're going to leave them blank rather than trying to fill them in. And so Paul said, Jesus told us this himself. So this is not somebody's opinion. This is not Peter and James sat down and were like, hey, we need something cool to close out the revivals as we go to town to town. This is not a man-made thing. Paul is letting us know, look, as crazy as this may sound, because if you are a skeptic, the whole concept just sounds ridiculous. So you believe Jesus is going to come in the sky? Yeah. You instantly got wrote off as a fool. And this is why the pastor Big Jeans can't preach it anymore. Because you can't get the key to the city and be cool if you're going to actually preach the book. I would rather be a fool for Jesus and just believe what the book said, whether you think it makes sense to you or not. And one of the reasons, the weight of that statement, we got this directly from the Lord. Jesus told us this himself. Now, if I was a controversial type preacher, I would say something like, so then if you don't believe in the rapture, you're telling Jesus that he's a liar. That will surely land you right in hell's fire. Then I would write a song because that rhymed right there. If you're telling Jesus he's a liar, you'll certainly land in hell's fire. And that would be controversial, especially going out over the intraweb right now. So we won't do that. I'll just tell you, Jesus is the one who said, 
I'm coming back to get you. You either trust him or you don't. Verse 16 was where Paul let us know the personality behind it all, and he left no ambiguity about it at all. The Lord himself will come down. Jesus personally coming for his church with the voice of the archangel. Most, most Bible teachers believe, speaking of Gabriel, the archangel, he will give a shout, and there will be the sounding of a trumpet, the trumpet call of God. A blasting call. There's nothing about this that's, that's uh, secretive or quiet. This is going to be dramatic. And it says that those of us, first the believers who've died, will rise. How fun is that? So, so now see, because Jesus knew, like, you know, some people will think that's crazy. That's why he showed off that he could do that when he was crucified. How many remember said the blood hit the ground and the earth began to shake and some guys that were dead got up. And it was Jesus showing, like, look, when I'm dying, I can bring them back. So when I'm returning and I want to do this on purpose, make no mistake about the fact that when Gabriel shouts and the trumpet of God is sounded, there will be a shaking in the earth, according to the word of God, that causes the dead church Every Christian that's ever died, every Christian that was ever martyred, you burned their ashes, you burned their bodies till they were ashes, you sprinkled their ashes in the river, they washed away and you thought you erased them. And with the trumpet call of God, DNA comes back together and a body is given back to that saint. And all around this world, there will be a mass resurrection at the sounding of God's trumpet. You say, well, that's crazy. It's cool is what it is. God is good. And it says that we don't get to, So the cool thing is about this to me is it actually means if we let the Bible be the Bible. Again, that's our goal here. We let the scriptures be the scriptures. The dead in Christ rise first. That means if you're still alive, you get to see that. I mean, how many of you realize there's a big old graveyard right there? At least some of those people were saints. I drive past that thing and I'm like, oh man. Can you imagine just a piercing call, a shout that reverberates and we get a second to go, no way. <laughs> and then <laughs> graves start flying open. This is going to be legit. <laughs> Amazing. And we get to see this and then the scripture says, those of us that remain will be gathered to meet the Lord in the air, the ultimate family reunion, oh, yeah. about 34,000 feet. <laughs> I'm just letting the Bible be the Bible. This is going to be tremendous, and it's one of the coming attractions. So we don't get every detail. We're just told, hey, this is going to happen, and then we get to decide. Now, I told you when we started into this, we'll get to the timing of things later. Right now, we're just talking about the events themselves. So if you're here, because the church, of course, over the years, huge piles of controversy. You know, everyone starts debating, well, when? And you're either pre-trib, you know, the trumpet sounds and everyone leaves before anything bad happens. Or then they came out with mid-trib, halfway through the trouble we leave. Then there was post-trib, we just go through all the trouble, and at the end it happens, and then there became pre-wrath rapture people, and then there was post-wrath rapture people, and then some of us got so annoyed, we were finally like, pan-trib, it'll all pan out, amen. Like, Jesus said he's coming, that's all I need to know. And so there's all this debate, we will get to all that later. Right now, we're just talking about this event that is promised to be in the future of the church. And you are, we're looking at something where there's no losing seat to be had. Right? If you die before this happens, you die knowing that you are only letting the grave borrow your body. Because at the sounding of the trumpet of God, you will be back. 
There's scripture in Corinthians, and we'll get to this next time, but there's scripture in Corinthians about the transformation of our bodies that happened. So, so how many are glad? <laughs> it, it, it won't be the same old one that you plant. Amen. I, if, I, if I drop over now, it'd take about nine pallbearers to get me into the ground. But, but when I come flying out, man, it'll look like I've been doing my diet right. And we'll have glorified bodies. And it'll be awesome, and it'll be powerful, and we'll look at each other and be like, man, you looking good. And you'll be like, no, nah, you look better. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be powerful. I want you to focus for a second with me again. Paul was so specific. We tell you this by the Lord's own word. So I want you to look Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 and 31. The scripture said that it was this scripture, this very well-known scripture, where his boys had actually finally asked him, hey, man, tell us when these things happen. Tell us what goes on. Tell us what we want to understand. Tell us what's happening. And Matthew 24, Jesus lays out very many things. And again, doesn't give all the details, just kind of gives the framework of the timeline. And so if Paul is he's saying, hey, by the Lord's own word, then this would appear to be the Lord's own word because it's the same event if we look at it. Verse 30, then at last, he said, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among the people of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of earth and heaven. Man, oh man. So what a powerful thing, right? Jesus has laid out a whole bunch of stuff, and before we're done, we'll get to it. We'll be dissecting Matthew 24. We'll be looking at how it compares to the seven seals, all that deep stuff that everybody wants to know. But notice the crescendo moment. He said, look, you'll see the sign of the Son of Man coming. And if we, if we take a moment, it doesn't take long to compare the two events, right, and figure out they're the same event. Because Paul said the Lord himself will descend and Jesus is declaring the Son of Man will come down. The same angels are mentioned, that the angels will be sent forth. The trumpet of God will be sounded. Both things are declared. Paul talks about the fact that the church will be rising. Jesus uses the term the chosen ones will be gathered from the four winds. It's clear. It's obvious. It's not complicated at all. You say, well, pastor, if it's clear and, and, and obvious, why are you repeating yourself? Well, because... Um, a weird side doctrine got going in the church about 50, 60 years ago, and it, it, it crept its way in, and, and we've all heard it. And because it pertains to the end times, it's usually considered not really a, a destructive doctrine. It's kind of like, oh, okay. But again, our goal here, as long as I'm here, is going to be that we use a little discipline and the scriptures teach what the scriptures teach. And so I'm really not concerned about who managed to sell a bunch of books somewhere because they came up with a theory. We have the book we need, right? So what am I talking about? Well, there's got to be this interesting teaching <laughs> that, that made it through and then it got into movies and then it got more and more accepted. And it was this idea that when the rapture happens, it's a secret. This idea, it got going in the church that when Jesus comes for the church, it'll be wild because no one will know. And it took on the stories of like the vanishing concept. So if you have read the Left Behind books, or if you suffered through the Left Behind movie, the idea becomes that you're, you're walking along, you're your lost self, you know, you're like at the airport. You're walking along in the airport, and you're talking, maybe your wife's born again, and you never had time for church, you know, and you're walking through the airport, and you're each dragging your Samsonite behind you, and then the way they told it was like, all of a sudden, there's a thud, and your wife's Samsonite is laying on the ground with all of her clothes, And she just gone. And then you, you start to go, oh, my wife is gone. And you turn to tell the guy at airport security, 
and his Bible's laying open on the counter where he was reading it, because he's gone. And then you go charging through the airport with all the other lost people trying to do the math on who's gone and who's still here because something happened, because people vanished. The problem with it really is that there's not really any scripture to support it. Now, as much as I, again, if you bought into that whole, you're like, no, I believe that's how it goes. I'm not even going to fight with you, but I'm just telling you, don't get your Bible out and come fight with me because you will have no ammo. There's very little, I mean, the only scripture, and we're going to look at it, I'm not afraid of anybody, we'll look right at it, but the only scripture that even hints at this, you really got to take a journey to make this secret return of Christ work. When we read the scriptures plain, it says this is dramatic, this happens, you can hear it, you can hear the sound, you can hear the shout, you can see the people rise, you can see the stuff happen, and by correlating and realizing that Jesus and Paul are talking about the same event, if we can go back to verse 30, Jesus said, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens and there will be deep mourning among all the people of the earth. Why? Because they will see this. This is not invisible. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, you go, well, wait a minute. That's not the way Tim LaHaye taught it when he did the Left Behind book. I know. And I love Brother Tim. He's a good guy. But they really did, through a doctrinal work that was called dispensationalism, they created the secret rapture of the church. Now, now why did they do it? Well, because that's what happens when men create an interpretive model for the Scripture. So I'm going to give this to you briefly. In weeks to come, we'll mine it a little more. But what they came up with was all this bad stuff's going to happen during the tribulation period. How many have heard of the tribulation? Amen? And the Antichrist is going to rise. We've heard of this guy. And there's going to be the false prophet, and there's going to be, you know, the mark of the beast. And we all know, man, Bill Gates. You get that chip? Praise God. You got the mark of the beast, baby. It has nothing to do with what you believe. I don't know. Watch your Facebook feed. People are getting funny. But here's the deal. We've heard of all of these things, and so this dispensational scriptural model required that the church couldn't be here. They, they, they got it in their head like, well, we can't be here for that, so we must leave before that. And they went, well, wait a minute, though, then we, need a, we got a problem here because this really looks like when Jesus comes back, everyone's going to know and so they used the next scripture we're going to look at to create this idea that somewhere before that dramatic event that Jesus clearly talked about, there would be this secret thing where we all vanish. And it became quite readily accepted. The church grabbed a hold of it. The church loved it. And if you came, if you were in the church at all, like say in the late 70s and 80s, uh, there was a, them cheesy movies started being made. You remember the $20,000 budget movies? And I, my favorite was the morning after. Now, how do you know? Nowadays, morning after, it has a whole different connotation than it had back then. But, but then it was the morning after. And the lady sleeps in, and she wakes up, and she hears this weird noise in the bathroom, and she walks in there, and his electric razor is running in the sink. Because while he was shaving, he vanished and his razor landed in the sink, and she was a backslidden mess, so she got left behind. And so that became how this was taught, like, you better hurry up and get right with Jesus, or we're going to all vanish and leave you here. Well, yeah, there is a part of this where we leave, clearly, taught in Scripture. But the way the Scriptures appear to teach it is actually far more dramatic and far more important than the version we made up. Because what Jesus is announcing is every person who rejected me and every person who had no time to follow me and every person who thought this was stupid, they are going to see enough to know they blew it. They will mourn when they see me in the clouds and they will hear the trumpet and they will get left behind. I personally think the movie would have been better if they would have done it that way. 
personally. I think with CGI now, they probably could have rocked it. Would have been good. So let's look at where the secret coming of Jesus came from and will be done. Matthew chapter 24, like I said, we're going to skip down to verse 37 is where Jesus, you know, got all this controversy rolling back then. He didn't realize we were going to really go crazy on this thing. Look at what he says in verse 37. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen, notice that, until the flood came and swept them all away. And this is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in a field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill and one will be taken and the other will be left. So you two must keep watch for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if the homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch, not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when he's least expected. Can you say amen? So Jesus tells us clearly that the event will surprise us. But he gave no even hint that it would be a secret. Okay? Understand, you really got to do some hard work, scriptural gymnastics, to figure out that two people are going to be working in a field, one will be taken and the other left, is no statement that the one left behind doesn't know there's no indication in that scripture that somehow he's just still plowing and goes like, I don't know, and keeps on going. That's not what he said. He just said one will be taken and one will be left. Two women grinding at the mill, he said, one is taken, one is left. Luke added the part that he brought in the nighttime part. Two people sleeping in a bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. All of this speaks to surprise, but none of this indicates this is a secret. And I believe Jesus put a rest to all of this because he said it's like it was in the days of Noah. And then he repeated himself, it will be like this, just like it was in the days of Noah. Is there anyone that actually thinks that everyone who died in Noah's flood didn't know? Right? Nobody would believe for a second that when it started raining, the only people who saw it was Noah and the rest of them were just nothing's happening I don't see anything Daryl do you see anything I don't say a thing that's not even implied brothers and sisters in the scripture Jesus is clearly teaching it will shock you it will happen in a moment and it'll make everyone go whoa here we go but he gave no indication that this was somehow a secret no he's saying you won't know exactly what moment you better stay ready because you don't know what moment. And even when he did the burglar thing, if the homeowner knew when the burglar was coming, he doesn't even imply the burglar comes and goes and the homeowner never knows. He's just saying that if you've never, if you've never happened to you, you're blessed. But if you are asleep in the middle of the night and you hear the glass on your front door break because somebody tries to come in your house, it's not that you didn't know. It's just, it shocks you every time you bolt straight awake and all your adrenaline hits because you know what it must mean. And this is what Jesus was speaking to, that this will happen in a sudden fashion. And here's the important part everybody leaves behind while they're trying to figure out how to make it a mystery. The point is, it will happen with a speed that makes it impossible to get right with God real quick then. The point that Jesus is making is serve me now. Because when this happens, you will all see it. But you will not have time to change your decision at my appearing. Why will there be mourning? Jesus was clear 
They will see and they will mourn. There's only one reason, because they had rejected him. And now he is clearly displayed as the savior of the world that you and I kept trying to tell them that he was. And they didn't have time and they weren't interested. And all of a sudden he will be right there. And it will happen with a speed and a suddenness and a quickness that leaves men unable to just real quick repent and pray and no, so that all these scriptures are speaking to speed and surprise, but not secrecy. This whole idea that all of a sudden everybody just wakes up in the morning and none of the Christians show up for work. And then everyone's wondering like, hey, you know, everyone in this office that used to listen to the Caleb, they're gone, man. What happened, bro? I guess they just decided to all quit. I don't know. Check their Facebook feed, bro. Oh, check it out, man. They have a post that was half of a post. It said, I think I hear something. <laughs> no, see, the, this whole thing got started, but there's not any Bible to back it up. No, what the Bible speaks to is that the rapture of the church is coming, that when the rapture of the church occurs, the notable part is that the trumpet of God himself will be sounded over this earth. And as we continue to study, you will find that the trumpet call of God is never without dramatic effect. There's no secret trumpet. I mean, because this thing was taught like the trumpet of God is actually this little quiet kazoo, right? I remember hearing guys preach this. And the archangel is invisible, and he just has a little kazoo, and he's like, Brrr. and the only people that hear it are the saints, and we go like, did you hear something? And then whoosh, we just vanish. And everybody around you at work, you know, there's bills at work, and people are handing him stuff, and they turn to hand him the next thing, and he's gone. His little apron is on the ground, and his hammer, and they go, wow, he must have had to really go. And it's like this mystery. No, that's not, what the, that's not what the scriptures teach. No, what the scriptures teach is that when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go away, I will come back and receive you to myself, that when he said that, he was not kidding. He was not speaking symbolically. He was not speaking some kind of literary advice to try to give us a, a picture of a hope that was just a dream. No, when Jesus said, look, I'm going, but I'll be back, he meant it. That when he told the church, labor on and hold on to me, because when this is over, you will overcome. There will be the sounding of the trumpet, and the whole world will know that they missed their Savior. The mourning and the trouble of everything that happens after that is actually born out of mankind knowing that they have no hope, not sitting around wondering where we went. The trumpet of God will sound. This is one of our coming attractions. How many are looking? Oh, come on. I went to, um, you know, you guys would not be surprised by this, but Old West History for me is fun. So we went to uh, Tombstone, Arizona. And we walked around and we stood where the gunfight happened, the OK Corral. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, man, people that talk tough now, they just got nothing. Man, you got nothing. You driving by in your car, shooting sideways out the window, don't tell me you're tough. This was an alley about the size of this stage. You got eight people and one guy's got a shotgun. You start shooting at each other close enough to shave the other guy. That's manhood right there. That ain't playing around. You start pulling steel when I'm looking at you. That's a whole nother level compared to what they do now. These cowboys were crazy. And so we're walking around and we went up on the, they have the, uh, the cemetery up there. And we walked up there and, and, and it's just the most intriguing cemetery you'll ever go to. Um, go in the winter. It's very hot there. So go in the winter. You're from Wyoming. Anything over about 90 and y'all start to just break down at a molecular level. And I understand that. So those of us from the Southwest, I want to help you. It gets hot. 
in tombstones to go in the winter, but you go walking along, and the whole story of the town, because see, we don't, do, we don't do tombstones right now. Everybody on a tombstone now, everyone was a great person. Have you ever noticed? In loving memory of, of John Smith, this date to that date, and that's all you get. And you look and you go, wow, John must have been a great guy. Well, why do you think that? Because they took the time to carve a flower into his tombstone. He must have been sweet. We get no info. Dude, those old west graveyards, the whole story's right on the thing. Here lies Corey. Corey was gunned down by Jim Decker. Next grave, Jim Decker. Jim was gunned down by Corey's wife. Wow. Next grave over, Corey's wife. She was gunned down by Jim's wife. Whoa. Next grave over, Jim's wife. She was gunned down by Corey's cousin. And you start going through, and you're like, man, whole families were wiping themselves out in a matter of like seven, eight days. They got crazy. Right in the middle was a preacher. There's a little headstone for a preacher who apparently was there in the midst of all that craziness and tried to preach Jesus. And if you've never read about the old, you know, the old preachers, circuit rider guys, and these guys that went into these towns that were just full, as much as you really feel like, oh, America's really gone bad, read a little history. There, <laughs> there was a time in this where any kind of sin you wanted to find, you could find walking down the street. And these guys would go, and it wasn't like now, like we come in here, we lock our door, we have our security guy, and if you don't like the fact that I'm in here preaching, bring it on, I don't care. Then they were alone, and they would start preaching hellfire and brimstone in the midst of a bunch of people who had guns that hated them. You had to be serious back then. There was no like, I think grandma wants me to be a preacher. Like you had to hear from God, man, because this was serious. And right in the middle of this graveyard there, Reverend so-and-so, uh, you know, he, and it had a funny little, it, I can't remember it now, it had a little funny rhyme on it. You know, uh, uh, he, he was, uh, he had a good look as he read the book or something, you know, like his little carved thing. And I started thinking, you know, when that guy died, he would have wondered, did I accomplish anything? coming here. I mean, this is a town with a brothel in every other building and gambling happening in every house that's not a brothel and people are killing themselves on the street and poor Corey's wife got gunned down by Joe and Joe's wife gunned down him and it would have been complete mayhem and anarchy and craziness and that little preacher and by looking at the dates on his thing, he only was about 42 years old when he died and it doesn't even say what he died from, and so many died from disease back then. And I found myself standing there looking at this grave marker and thinking, you know, that little preacher probably died wondering, should I have even come here? This has been a mess. Then what, the, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the moment he was absent from his body, he was present with the Lord. So he breathes his last breath in Tombstone, Arizona. And I'm telling you right now, if you think you've been to the backside of the earth, Tombstone is the backside of the earth. So this guy breathed out his last breath looking at that sand and wondering if his life mattered. The very next second, he was standing in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. And and all of a sudden, it's his reward, and it was all worth it, right? And he's there waiting, waiting for this next event. That at the sounding of the trumpet, that little pitiful grave they gave him in Tombstone is going to bust open. And people who are at Tombstone just wandering around <laughs> are going to hear, what is that? Going to see going to have a moment and going to see little reverend, I think it was like Timmons or something like that, come up through the ground and go, yes, that was worth it, and be part of the greatest resurrection declared anywhere in the word of God at the sounding of the trumpet of God. 
the coming attractions for the church are good. I personally find that reminding myself of them helps me put in some context some of this stuff that everybody's so upset about. Pastor, if they try to tell us we have to wear masks at church, we should take up arms. If they try to tell us we can't sing, we should turn up the music louder. If so-and-so gets in office, I'm going to Canada. Be careful with that one because nobody ever actually does that. Some of them, I mean, last time, how many waited for some of them, right? Like, great, I will help you pack. But they didn't actually go. They just stayed. So be careful with all of that. But I'm going to tell you what, they inundate us with all this constant controversy. And if you're not careful, we start boiling down and we just wind up in the flesh. Just upset and ticked off and frustrated. Get back in the word of God and realize, no matter who's president, when Jesus tells Gabriel, shout, this will happen. And it won't make any difference what's going on with the politics. It won't make any difference who won the election. It won't matter whether or not America still looks free or America looks like France. It won't make any difference. The eternal truths of the kingdom of God do not rise and fall on the whims of our culture. And you and I are kingdom people. And we are waiting for our king. And he will return. And when he does, it will balance the books on all of this stuff. So be encouraged by by these words. If you are in Christ, he's coming back for you. If that's good news to you, give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Why don't you stand with me this morning? We're going to pray real quickly. I even all messed around and ended on time. Don't tell me there's no miracles. Amen. Father, we love you. And we pray, God, that you would help us be renewed in the spirit of our thinking by your word, that we would trust you completely because you are trustworthy and you know those that are yours and you are coming back again. And we praise you. And we're going to continue to look at this and we're going to continue to ask that the Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and understanding so that we could be built up in the truth but well, we pray that you'd give us hearts for the truth. For we live in a day and an hour which is perilous. Paul told us that it would be when men reject truth. Lord, we can't judge or we can't change what others do with the truth. But we can have a heart for what our own spirits are doing when we hear the truth. And we want to be people of the truth. Lead us in the way that we should go. And I'll have our hearts, God, by your spirit encouraged we are on the team that wins. Your kingdom is the kingdom that lasts forever. And the people can rage back and forth. We'll look at other scriptures where it talks about that the mockers and the scoffers will say, he's never coming again because everything continues on like it always has been. But Lord, in a moment when people are working and people are sleeping, the trumpet of God will sound. And in that moment, you will set it right. And we give you praise, Father, for the gift of knowing your son, Jesus. We didn't find you. You found us. For no man comes unless the Father draws him. And even then you made that promise. And I will raise him up on that last day. We give you praise, Father. We ask you to seal this good word in our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. It was good to see you today. Good to be home. I pray that if you have any questions or you need prayer about anything, let us know. Next Sunday, like I said, the friars will be ministering. It'll be awesome. So if you have friends or family that you're afraid to have them hear me preach, that's great because next week it'll all just be music, so you can bring them. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day, and tell somebody how good Jesus is. <laughs>